our project at this point is all internal in that everything that we're looking at is within this one HTML file. Sometimes we would need to load external content. And the, the way we're going to do this is, is very simple, probably not exactly what you would think about in, when you hear about learning loading external content. Obviously more complicated would be that we tap into a database on a server and pull that external content and load it up in our project. We're not going to get to that because first of all we need a server. We need a server that holds all of that data in our database. So how many of you have right now a server and has database capabilities? <laughs> like one or two people. So we won't be able to add that kind of infrastructure to our app because we just don't have the infrastructure. The, the way that the reason that these apps like Instagram work and Facebook and all of that is because you have in your hand part of the, the, the app, part of the project, but the other part is happening on a server. There's a secure connection from your device to the main server, stuff happens on the server, the data comes back to the device, gets parsed and rendered, and then it seems pretty flawless, except when you've got bad reception, of course. So we won't be able to do any of that. In the three classes, we're not going to be able to link to a database on an external server and such. We will work with databases, but they will be uh, internal to the app itself. But we won't be connecting out to external content. You can do that, but that's out of our scope. One basic way that we're going to do this, and then we'll improve it in the Android class, part two, is we can load external web pages. We'll do it the most basic way here and then again when we get to next month we'll do it much better using something called the in-app browser. You've probably seen this in in your own apps where you're you're using your app you click a button and like a mini web browser appears in the app you browse a web page you close that and you're still in your app. We'll be able to do that once we get to the second part of the course. Today we'll just do it very basically. But I want to uh, in the art screen I want to open, I've got Art Calendar, and then I also want to open uh, the latest classes, the latest art classes. And I can pull those in from the, from the college's main website. So we, we can do that part. So I want to add a brand new button here to the Art Classes screen that links to external content. And that needs a couple of, of things to keep in mind. So let's, let's go find where you've got the art calendar. That seems to be at line 152. Line 151 is where my grid starts. UI grid A, there's where we add, that's, where we, that's where we aligned the content. We've got div class block A, B, and then A and B. So first row, second row. So on the first row, second column, which is line 156. We're going to add a brand new button here so that that goes over to the external content. Yes, we can copy and paste. No, we won't. We'll do it the long way first. So we will write um, the text of latest uh, classes. The button is going to say latest classes. We're going to wrap the A tag around that. so that that is an active link. It needs an href, which we'll fill in in a moment, so for the moment we'll just put the pound sign, put the dummy link. Um, this makes it behave like a link, it just doesn't go anywhere. That's going to look like a plain old underlined link, so of course then we add data role button. I would like an icon, so what comes next? Data-icon, and then we have to look up an icon that would, that would work well here. This might be like a list of classes, like a horizontal bullet point list of classes, and I think that we've got one which is bullets. This is going to make like a mini bullet point list in the icon. That might be nice. So data icon bullets. And what else? Data inline true. 
So under data dash inline equals true. The point of that is that now the button won't be huge. It'll only be as big as the content inside of it. Let's see. Let's see how that looks. So under the art screen, now I've got art classes or art calendar latest classes. Looks like a button, it's got an icon, it's got the text, it's centered within the area. If it were larger, it would still be centered. There's the code so far. So, again, we've seen that. That shouldn't be anything new, except maybe the data icon bullets. As you use these different uh, jQuery mobile uh, as you use these different jQuery mobile components and such, you'll start to remember some of these, specifically the icons. Now the difference here is that this is not going to link to content within this index file. It's going to link to external content, another website. So we're going to add the address to where it's linking to, and then we're also going to add an extra property because now we're going to link to external content. We need to break out of the world of the jQuery mobile project. So we'll go to the href and we'll change that to a, a full valid web address, http colon slash slash. We'll look up the exact address in a moment, but for right now we'll just put it to sdce.edu. That's going to link over to some other address. No problem. But then we also need doesn't matter where we add it, but I'll add it right after the href, rel equals. What's the relationship between this link that we're pointing to and the current document? The relationship is that that link is external. I've tested this in various browsers. On some browsers, it works without it. And on some browsers, if you don't use it, the link doesn't work. I've seen that it most consistently works if you do have rel external. Well, it's the same as the previous line up here. No, I mean at the very end of KSD. Mm -hmm. The data inline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same as the one up here. So anyway, go ahead and save it and then uh, run it and see if it works. It's going to then open um, the other website, like a plain old link, like you would have expected. Uh, doesn't look that special, especially within the, the concept of our jQuery mobile project, but uh, we will upgrade it and make it look a little bit better. See how this works. Art. Click on latest classes. It goes to the latest classes. Well, the college's website. I want to specifically perhaps show the latest art classes. So we can go over to the take a class screen. Let's see if there's any classes that have the keyword art in them. Adaptive Arts and Crafts, Android Apps, and this, there must be the word art in there somewhere. But let's say this res these results. So I searched for art. I also want to change this start date. The point is that I can now get an address up here. This is the address I really want. This is going to search Notice it's searching for the keyword art, sorting ascending start date. So that's the address I want. I'm obviously not going to spell it out. If you want this address, just search for it on the, on the website and then plug it into the href right there. That's the real link. Oh. 
So what's happening here is that we are linking to external content. It doesn't look that nice within our current project. Um, one thing that we can do is that notice if someone clicks on that it takes over the whole project and therefore they they browse the catalog they are done with the catalog they close the catalog and that also closed our web app didn't it so we'll add one more item here this is an old HTML uh, construct this is nothing related to jQuery mobile or any of that stuff but after rel external then we can write target equals quotes underscore blank and now at that point when you save it and run it you should see that that other website opens in its own window I have a little bit of 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 a little b
not have a notebook. I feel like when I'm on the keys, I gotta get more sympathy. I'm like hitting two with my fingers, so big to hit like two of these keys. Crap. All right, so did everyone get that to work? So the the point of the adding that target blank was that it just opens in a new tab, and that is um, works great or good enough for a web app. It opens in a new tab. When we get to the point of um, this being an actual Android app, we'll use what's known as the in-app browser, which will load this external content within the app in its own like mini web browser, and you'll have the full back and forward history and all of that. And you can close the mini browser, the in-app browser, and then it takes you right back to this screen here. So you've probably seen that in apps. It might have been subtle. You may have never have noticed it, but you've probably come across it. And that's the in-app browser that we'll be able to implement once we upgrade this to an Android app next month. So at this point, we're OK. But the big concept is that if you're going to link to external content, you want to add the rel external. And the point of that, as the documentation says, is because this breaks us out of the, the whole paradigm that jQuery Mobile has set up, which basically uh, Ajax is happening and it uh, hijacks the link. And so when we're trying to go out to some completely different site, that might cause problems in the web browser. So we're saying this is an external uh, resource. Don't keep it within the whole world of jQuery Mobile. And then we've got target blank, which creates a new tab or window. And um, that's an external link. The other items of the project, you know, we can still work on adding this section header and so forth, but that's just that's a triviality, of course. Um, well, we'll do one briefly because then you'll see that this is a pretty straightforward element, and then we'll go on. As I said, we're we're getting a little, we're, we're a pretty we're really well on track. We're actually going to be slightly faster than what the calendar had. What I want to do is just for a moment add a little bit of content to the art classes section, um, just to see how that works, and then we'll go on. So. If, we find, if, if we're here within this art classes section and we go back up just a little bit, we'll see we've got this whole div of data role collapsible set. And the way this works is it's a generic div. It has a data role collapsible set. Then it has a div of data role collapsible, three of them. Section header, section header, section header. And because there's an H3, that's what actually appears as the section header. So on line 136, we can change that to art 101. And then that easily changes the text in the collapsible component header. The content inside of it that appears once you open it is simply any content that we add after the H3. So if I write a plain old paragraph, right after the H3 for R201. And 
and you save it and run it, that content will appear in the collapsible components um, box. Any content should be able to go here, so we can put a picture, we can put bullet points, I suppose we could put a uh, a list view inside of this, although that's weird. You can put any content in here. You could put a video in here. If we have the code for a video, we could put the video in this so that when it opens up, then the video shows. So again, this uh, we won't do too much of this. You can work on that if you'd like. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with that kind of content a little bit later. I'm still kind of thinking about structural wise and so forth. So um, this is as far as I'll go, but any general questions on this collapsible set? It's pretty straightforward. Whatever content that you add, as long as it's within this div of that data role collapsible, it'll be within it. And the name of the collapsible clickable item is the H3. So I'm going to shift gears then. Like I said, we've, we've done enough there's still stuff to learn and, and add to the project, like the whole map thing. The map is going to work via JavaScript, and that's a whole can of worms. That's a whole class in and of itself. It's a whole month-long, six-month-long course. It could be JavaScript itself. It's very powerful. It's really one of the pillars of modern web design. Uh, people can do so much with JavaScript because it's so powerful. It evolved... Um, I believe it was first invented by the developers of Netscape. Remember Netscape Navigator? Uh, in the late mid to late 90s or so, they wanted to invent something that would be able to create interactivity. So um, it's basically everywhere now. JavaScript is, is um, in many websites, very powerful. <clears throat> and um, if you're used to other programming languages like you know C Sharp or C++ or those sorts of things, uh, you'll see some similarities, a bunch of differences, of course. It is object-oriented to some degree, but um, it's more of a scripting language. It's more of a lightweight kind of language, although you will be able to create variables and um, functions and all that cool stuff like in a real language. So what we're going to do then is shift gears, and we're going to start with, a, with you know, a step one, day one, a uh, quick, short, small lesson on JavaScript. This is JavaScript. This is a, we're going to do a kind of welcome to JavaScript thing. So if you've already got some experience, again, this might be way too basic. But if you've never used JavaScript, this is going to be brand new. Once we get some basic stuff, then we'll be able to go faster and further because we've got jQuery and we've got jQuery Mobile. And those will allow us to do things very quickly. Just like we started day one very basically, and already in day two or day three, we were getting into jQuery Mobile to create an interface and all of that. So just for the moment what I'm going to do is put my current files up to this point in the network folder if you want a copy of them and then what we're going to do is work with a brand new empty file let me just set this up here So here in, um, in Notepad, I'm going to close the CSS file that I was working with. If you've still got it open, I'm going to close the index file. You can close this change log if you want. And we're going to have a brand new empty document. So either, either close your files or just go to File New. Let's create a new empty document. Let's save it. We're going to save it into our current project folder just so that we can find it. It's all organized. So let's save into your Android project with today's date. 
and doesn't need to be in the mobile website, doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to save this as JavaScript Basics and save it as an HTML file. I'll explain why in a moment. So just see, just create a brand new empty file, save it. I'm calling it JavaScript Basics .html. JavaScript is very similar to CSS in that we can write it inline, meaning right in this document, um, either in a meta section or on an actual line of code, or we can have it in a separate file, just like that. So um, JavaScript is flexible in that way. We will, of course, when we get down to this for real, write our JavaScript from the, in that external file. We don't need to do that just yet. We're going to keep it in one file altogether just so that we can work with it together and understand it. Here then we're going to need to create a very, very basic HTML file again. So this will take us back to the, you know, day one. So just a little bit of practice again. We're going to create the basic HTML5 file. So you can write what I'm writing, or if you remember it, that'd be good. just those eight lines is fine. So write something like that, very, very, very basic HTML file. Nothing happens if you run it, really. But uh, just go ahead and create that skeleton, and then we'll start to talk about JavaScript. We need that basic first to talk about JavaScript. So hopefully you've got something like this. When we first wrote our HTML, we wrote the classic Hello World. And we wrote that in the body. We wrote Hello World in the body. And it appeared on screen. We're going to write Hello World in JavaScript. There's many ways to do this. Here's one of the most direct ways. We're going to write JavaScript, and we're going to, uh, it's not going to be inline, but it's going to be in the head section of the document. We could write within one document, we can write it in the head, we could write it in the body, that'll work. We can also write it in an external file. So there's the external, and I'm blanking on the exact name about what it's called when it's under head. Anyone remember that? It's not inline, is it? It's a slightly different name. Whatever it's called. We can write it in the internal, internal uh, embedded. Those sound about right. The point is that they're within this one document rather than external. So you just have to remember there's the external version and then there's the internal, but I'm sure there's a specific name if it's in the head because we can also have it in the body or we can have it in line with one line of code. Um, embedded sort of sounds right. But anyway, the way what, that we do this then, we'll go back to the head and then um, right after meta we'll write script tags. That has a pair. We're using HTML5, the latest standard, and in HTML5 it's assumed that whenever we have script it's JavaScript. 
that's how common JavaScript is, that's how important, that's how much of a pillar it is. Because in the old days, when we had an older version of HTML, we would have to write script text equals type slash JavaScript. Don't write this. We would have to write that in the old days, because what kind of script do we mean? Do we mean CoffeeScript? Do we mean JavaScript? Do we mean what else? whatever else there is? But no, nowadays JavaScript is de facto. Not even de facto, de jour. It's like this is it. So we don't have to write that and save a few bytes. Script means JavaScript. If it's another kind of script, then yes, we would write type equals text slash, I don't know, ASP or something. So this is going to be JavaScript. Whatever we write within those two tags. It will write hello world. One of the most simple ways to do it, because there's many ways to do this, is um, document dot write. Basically we're saying on the document dot write, we're going to write on screen, open close parentheses, semicolon. This is a complete command here. Right here what we're saying is we're going to write something onto the document. Semicolon. We're going to often end the line of JavaScript with a semicolon. It terminates the statement. Within write, within the parentheses, in quotes, you can write hello world. document.write, hello world. Save and run that. Save and run that, and what happens? If it worked, we should see that we've got hello world on screen. What we've done here is there is an object, the document, the document on screen in the web browser, and it has a method, um, a method, a way to do something. So the document has a way to do something, a method. The method is write. So on the document, write what I wrote here in quotation marks, hello world. And it did it. Hello world on screen. That's one of the most basic ways to write something on screen via JavaScript. We have another way to do it, of course. So let's say we wanted to comment out this JavaScript. We've seen that for HTML, the comment code this is a n html comment we've seen that one if we add css This is a CSS comment. And a JavaScript comment. <coughs> so that same kind of comment that we've used, that we've seen for CSS we can use for JavaScript. JavaScript, though, also has one more type of comment. This is also a JavaScript comment. The big difference is used for one line only. Wherever you write the double slash, no spaces here. Slash slash, no spaces. Wherever you write the double slash, everything that follows on that line is commented out. Only that line. 
So if you wanted multi-line comments, you would continue to use the slash asterisk. Press enter as many times as you want. <coughs> asterisk slash multi-line comment. If you want one line to be commented out of JavaScript, double slashes does that. What's the advantage? Saving time and effort. I want to comment that out. Done instead of slash and then go over to shift asterisk and then go to the end and then asterisk slash. That might take half a second, but those half seconds add up. And again, I'm already there, double slash, done. So it's more about speed, I think. Yeah, that's your quick question. Yes. Did you say we did not have to save this in the mobile web? Yeah. That's right, you don't have to save it in mobile web, just anywhere on your flash drive, really. It's going to be an independent file. So the important part about that is that there's no space between those two slashes. Notice it didn't turn green. It thinks it's a command. You have no spaces between it, but you can have spaces here. And it's a single line comment, so it, it doesn't need any terminating line at the end. You know, sometimes I see people just because they're very OCD, they might write slash, slash, slash. Get it? But not necessary. So let's just say, let's comment out that document.write. Here's another way to say hello world. Next line. We'll write alert. Notice I didn't write document.write this time. Um, depending on the object that we're working with, we have to start to think about, as we get deeper into this, objects. What are we working with? Previously, I said document.write. The document was the object. I'm saying on the document, write this. Here I didn't note what am I attaching the command to. It's being put to the it's being put to the whole screen, as we'll see in a moment. So we're gonna say alert in quotes again, hello world save it and run it. What's the difference this time? Pop-up box. Pop-up box that says hello world with an OK button. So an alert is a very simple pop-up box, and in the pop-up box is the text that we wrote. Hello world. If you open this in Chrome, for example, it looks a little different. JavaScript alert, hello world, with, a, with an OK here and a close there. If you run it in Internet Explorer, You mean the, the X on the top right? Yeah. Hmm. In Internet Explorer here it says message from web page. Hello world. So every browser is interpreting that same code a little bit different. In Firefox it didn't give me the little close. In Chrome it did. Um, if it looks different, that's okay. That's what I'm getting at. Different browsers interpret this in slightly different ways. But the point is that it made a pop-up box. Yes. The alert is sort of like, in a sense, so universal that you don't have to specify that it's a window. But in the technical sense, the documentation says that that would be the most correct. So I'm just showing, before we said document.write, and then what you're saying there about having window.alert would be technically more correct. But some commands, we can have them in shorthand. And then when we get over to uh, using jQuery, jQuery, we can have even more shorthands. So for the moment, this works fine. 
let's say, let's comment that one out. Let's do something else here. So let's add two slashes to comment that out. Let's do it this way. Let's write console.log, open close parentheses, and then in quotes, hello world. Save and run that. Notice here I used the dot notation. I'm specifying what object, where to use this particular command, this method, um, dot log. I attached it to the console. What's the console? Well, let's run it and see. When you save it and run it, what happens? Do you see Hello World? I do. Right click, inspect element, console, hello world. So if nothing appears here, which it won't, right click, inspect element, view the console, hello world. The console is the screen in our web browser or other software like Eclipse where we see where we can see these messages that are hidden from the regular user. Um, the web browsers have a console built in. We're looking at it in Firefox. You can go look at the same thing in Chrome. What's it called? F12? On Chrome, uh, yeah, it should be F12. It should be F12. So it's still going to be inspect element. And then when you load inspect element, then you can select the console. So I'm going to load Chrome. I'm going to right click inspect element. And then it's probably over here console. Yeah, they've all got one. But anyway, this is the console. This is something we're going to look at a lot when we deal with JavaScript. The console. Um, we've written something to the console. This is going to be useful to, uh, for us like when we're trying to write some code, maybe capture user input. If we don't see anything visually on screen, we could output it to the console to help us figure out what's going on. Let's say we're trying to do some app that adds up numbers for some reason. We could have that math happening in the console so that it doesn't show on screen and confuse the user. We could give ourselves comments here like, is this button working? If we add a little console output that says button working, we'll see it in here. That means it's working. If we don't see button working, it's not working. We can help ourselves figure out what's going on. So we're going to get used to using the console. Again, it doesn't show by default. You have to right-click and select Inspect Element and switch to the console here, and we see it. So that was another way to write Hello World. But this is more for the developer. The regular user won't see this. And it's going to be very useful once we get more complicated apps, specifically when we talk about JavaScript. So notice with all three of those that we wrote here, this happened right away. We loaded the HTML file and then it happened. Because the web browser loads the HTML file, it reads it line by line, and it processes it line by line. So it read that this is an HTML5 document, start the HTML, start the head. Um, work with the UTF, UTFA character set, and then it got to the part about script, okay, JavaScript's coming. Then it got to this part, skipped it, skipped it because it's commented, then it got to console, and then it did it. Did you notice that, well, you wouldn't exactly be able to see it, but let me tell you what would happen. If we added script down in the body, 
we could have a bunch of stuff happen on screen first and then the JavaScript because it goes in that order. So here we're making this happen right away. We may or may not want that. Sometimes in the logic of all of this, we don't want the JavaScript to run first. We want other things to happen first. So we could put this whole script section down here under body. You don't have to do this, but it would also be valid to have it here in body. So therefore, I could have a bunch of stuff happening here first, and then the JavaScript. And sometimes we need to do that because, let's say, we're dealing with math or calculations and so forth, and you can't add 1 plus x until we've defined x. And if we tell it to run right away, we've never defined x, we get a, a problem. So we're going to see that once we start dealing with JavaScript and other such scripting languages, logic languages and such, you're going to find out that now you're going to have to deal with syntax errors and logic errors. Syntax errors are simply, did I write the command right? Did I write log or did I write log? That's a syntax error because it's the wrong keyword. It's the wrong command. It won't work. But a logic error might have been that you never heard of the console, so I don't see that text appearing. A logic error will be more prevalent when we deal with like if else statements and other logical operators, meaning like if the user logged in, do that, or else they didn't log in, do this. But we set up the wrong conditions and therefore our logic doesn't work. We think the user logged in, but they didn't really log in, but our code works. Well, that's going to be a logic problem, and that's often harder to figure out what went wrong. A syntax error. could be something that we can figure out easier because in theory the console is going to tell us those errors. In theory. Depending on the type of error. So in this case it didn't. But there'll be many cases where... Let me see if I can force an error here. Okay, right there. Reference error. Alert A is not defined. So sometimes the console here will tell us what the error in our code is. Unfortunately, um, the console really it oftentimes gives us feedback that is very esoteric, that is very like written for nerds, by nerds. I guess we're all nerds here, but maybe we're not JavaScript nerds yet. So. Uh, sometimes these error messages like reference error, what does that mean? Why did you just tell me I misspelled it? So sometimes these error messages aren't as direct as they could be. And from what I read recently, supposedly Google Chrome is supposed to be addressing this much better. Google Chrome is supposed to be giving us better um, syntax errors. Let's see. Uncaught reference error. Sounds almost the same. Alert A is not defined. So that's also why the uh, why the console is important. It'll help us hopefully figure out some of these errors. Logic errors might be harder to catch. The console could help us catch our syntax errors, which is misspelling the commands. So I was also saying that these three JavaScripts happened um, right away because they were some of the first things defined in the document. Let's say we want um, Hello World to appear and not until someone clicks a button. So it's going to wait until our interaction. This happened by itself with no interaction. Sometimes we want a result from an action. So um, I'm going to comment out all that right there. If we want something to be deferred, something to happen to wait until we interact, one way to do it is to define a function. So let's write function. That's a keyword. Notice it becomes blue and, and it italicizes. A function, basically, 
is a set of commands wrapped together with one unique name. So I'm going to define, I'm going to sort of invent my own JavaScript command. Console is reserved. Log is reserved. Alert is reserved. Write is reserved. There's a whole list of reserved JavaScript commands. With function, we can, in a sense, create our own. So I'm going to say function hello pop-up. I'm inventing a brand new JavaScript command, sort of, called hello pop-up. Pop -up. Case sensitivity is important. So right now, if I didn't notice, my up was all caps, and I was going to forget that and write it with lowercase, and then it wouldn't work. So uppercase and lowercase does matter. The syntax of this is we write function, that's the reserved word. What's the name of the function we're inventing? That's the name. Then we write uh, open and close parentheses. Because notice these have been having a parentheses open and closing as well, where we feed into it a parameter. <coughs> and then this would look familiar. Space, curly brace, couple of enters, close curly brace, semicolon. That's kind of like CSS, where we had a class, open close curly braces, and then in between the curly braces we defined this is what this class means. Here I'm basically saying we're creating this brand new JavaScript command, hello pop-up, and we're defining what it does or what it, how it behaves within the curly braces, and then I end the statement with a semicolon. That's one thing you'll have to get used to. You'll often see the semicolon at the end of, a, of almost every statement in JavaScript, except when we don't need it, which I'll mention when. And what I want to happen, what I want Hello Pop-Up to do is alert Hello World. If we save this and run this, nothing will happen at all, not even in the console. We didn't say output to the console, so obviously nothing happens in the console. But nothing happens here because there was no trigger to make this happen. The other commands were written, you know, just kind of naked right there. They just happened. They didn't have any special circumstances. This one won't happen until we trigger it. So yeah, nothing happens. If I check the console, nothing's in the console. I want to trigger that. I want to, I want to run that. I want to execute that. Hello pop-up. Here's one way to do it. Let's go to the body. Let's write click for pop-up. I want to make that text, when we click it, I want it to pop up. Hello world. This is what's going to be our our trigger to make that function execute. At this point though, if we were saved it and run it, it wouldn't know that. It wouldn't know that just because it says click, it doesn't know that if we click that, it means that function because we could have 40 functions. We could have 400 functions. So which function do we mean? Let's make this a, a link. Yes. Now you have a space, and the click for pop up, there's a space between pop and up, and mm -hmm. then back in the function, there's a space. Does that matter? No, because this is going to be for the people to read. Okay. The one up there in function, I don't want spaces in the names of my functions, that'll break things. That's not proper syntax. So that's just for the people to read, and then within the script section, no spaces. <laughs> So this is going to be a link, and when I click this link, it's going to um, run that function. Let's do href equals, well it's not going to go anywhere, it's not really going to link to any place. What was that uh, thing that we have to do here so that it acts like a link but it doesn't really work like a link? Hashtag. Just the hashtag? pound sign. 
after the href, here's a brand new property on click equals quotes. So we're saying, once this link is clicked, do something. Again, if you've already got some experience, you might be saying, why are we doing it this way? Remember, we're doing day one first. So on click, hello, pop up, open close parentheses, semicolon. We're saying once this link is clicked, run that function. And that function means make an alert pop up happen. Try it, save it, and run it. Nothing happens until you click the link. Nothing should happen until you click the link. See if mine worked. Click for pop up, click, pop up. Raise your hand if it worked. All right, now take that hand and pat yourself on the back. You are a JavaScript developer now. Anyone need a little help? Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to explore why I've been putting in my dark box. Oh, this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me save this whole project as .js. We're not going to save it as JavaScript. We're going to save it as HTML. Okay. 
we were working with the JavaScript, which still would be being made in an HTML file. Okay. So we'll take the and we got an HTML file with JavaScript. Anyone else? I live on console, I can't see anything. Yeah, you're not going to see anything in the console, but if you try clicking on this, that's all you want. Nothing happens in the console. Mm -hmm. Why does it have a message about don't create any more dialogue? Did any of you see that, that it pops up and it says create no more dialogue boxes? That's because in the beginning, JavaScript had a bad, uh, a bad, uh, a bad name that spammers would use it to make a bunch of pop-ups appear on our screen. Remember that when we get so many pop-ups from browsing a website? That's what that is. That the web browser would say, stop making more pop-ups happen. So um, that's why that is. Um, because the, br the browser is just trying to protect us from multiple pop-ups because it might think a spammer is trying to make a lot of pop-ups happen. Okay, so Notice then this is a this is another way to do the same sort of thing. We made a pop-up happen, but this time through user interaction. That's again the third pillar of this whole app and about modern websites. HTML for the for the basic structure and content, CSS for the design and the layout, JavaScript for the interactivity. This is obviously very basic interactivity, but let's try this. Let's say um, Let's change this. Instead of it saying alert, let's comment that out for a moment on the next line. I'm still within the function. Just comment out the, the alert. I'm still within the curly braces, line 11. This time let's write prompt. And in quotes we'll write login. Save it and run it. Instead of alert, type prompt, and we have a new message there. Login. What does that do? So you still have the same link. If you <coughs> click that link, you get a new pop-up. The new pop-up now should have a little box for you to log in. So I can log in. I've got cancel. I've got OK. Click OK. Now, <coughs> whatever you just typed in there, and when you clicked OK, that then went off to uh, the big bit bucket in the sky. That data that you plugged in, that name or whatever that you plugged in, you, we never told it to save it or process it or do anything with it, so it just went away. A person typed in their login credentials like their plain text password, and then nothing happened with it. So, again, we're dealing with a system that is very literal, that if you don't program something, it won't do it, it won't ask you to do something, you have to debug it, you have to figure out possible user errors, and all of that. So just because we wrote a prompt here, it's kind of looking like this is going to be my login. Great, I'll be able to have login capabilities to my app. Uh, this is like 1% of that whole solution, just to capture their name. Then you have to process it, and if it's a password, deal with decrypting the password and all of that stuff. So I'm just getting at that. There's many building blocks to talk about with JavaScript. Obviously, we'll not be able to cover them all, but we'll be able to cover enough of them that are useful to us for this project. Yes? Can you make a, do that until it's all letters or all numbers or you know, until, until it's a some format? You mean if someone tries to, if we were expecting only words and someone wrote yeah. a number? Yeah, we, will be, we would be able to work with that so that only accepts certain input. Uh -huh. From our current knowledge right now though, that's complicated. But using other libraries like jQuery and other things, it makes it easier. 
Because right now we're using the most basic JavaScript, which means we have to write it all explicitly. jQuery was invented, remember their tagline, uh, write less, do more. So there's a jQuery command, perhaps, that will help solve that problem without having us write 20 lines of code. So that's... Exactly. So stepping back a moment, we're writing plain old JavaScript. If we had a reference in the head to jQuery mobile, or jQuery that is, then we'd be able to write jQuery specific code. But we'll stick with the basics first. So if you've got if we've got this much working, if you've got this much working, it's a good time to to take a short break. Uh, when we get back, we'll make it do more interesting things as we learn more about JavaScript. We'll be back in ten minutes at eight thirty.